Hi, everybody. My name is Griffin Bridgers. Welcome back to the basics of GST tax. This is part six, where we're going to cover indirect skips. As always, I want to remind you that this presentation is not intended to substitute for legal or tax advice and is provided for educational purposes only. If you want, you can skip over this part, but as I've reminded you at the beginning of each part so far, this is a series that's designed not for the client, but for those who work in private wealth to learn more about the basics of generation skipping transfer tax or GST tax. So anybody dealing with intergenerational transfers of wealth is the target audience here because the series assumes that you know some of the basics of the estate tax, the gift tax, and their associated exclusions, deductions, and credits. So to get maximum value, I suggest you be familiar with gift and estate taxes first, but with that caveat, anybody can get value out of this with maybe that lack of color in the background. But to recap so far, in part five, I introduced the concept of allocating uh, your GST exemption, which is equal to your uh, estate tax exclusion amount, and you'd first allocate that to direct skips and then to a yet undefined term known as indirect skips. We can do that manually or we can rely on the law to do it automatically for us as we briefly looked at last time. But now we need to dive into the how and look at specifically what are indirect skips. And to start, we're gonna to look to both the code, but preferentially form 709, which is the gift tax return. So I'm gonna start off not necessarily with bullet points, but showing you the part of the form uh, 709, the gift tax return that's going to deal with this because the gift tax return is going to be the mechanism through which we can not only calculate how much of our gift tax applicable credit amount is applied to current year and cumulative taxable gifts, but also the mechanism through which we can achieve what we talked about in part five, the allocation, remember that term, of GST tax exemption. So, we see here on part three, the headline, the heading is indirect skips and other transfers and trusts, which gives us kind of a hint as to where we're going with this. We're going to look at a couple items. One is a gift to a trust that is an indirect skip as defined under code section 2632 or to trusts that are currently subject to gift tax and may later be subject to generation skipping transfer tax. So that tees things up a bit for us to look at an indirect skip. Now I'm not going to dive into the definition of this because all the code says is that an indirect skip is going to be a transfer that's not a direct skip. But does that necessarily mean that you have to have a transfer to a skip person and does that skip person have to be living? Well, let's dive in a bit more. Most gifts to irrevocable trusts will be treated as taxable gifts to first and foremost. And to the extent these gifts exceed any gift tax annual exclusion, that's the amount of your taxable gift. Typically, you'd have to have things like certain types of trusts or crummy rights to get the gift tax annual exclusion. Now, what's more complicated than is necessary and can't really be done justice in this part today is that you also have a GST tax annual exclusion, but it works a little bit differently than the gift tax annual exclusion. And we'll later learn about that specific annual exclusion for GST tax purposes. But this caption that we see on Form 709 Schedule A Part 3 is instructive. We need either a trust described in Code Section 2632 as what we're going to see is a GST trust, a new undefined term that we're going to dive into in greater detail later, but we don't necessarily need to know. Or more often, what we're going to deal with is a trust for which there is GST potential. So what this means, in other words, is we're going to look to an indirect skip where there's a gift to a trust and not a transfer at death. In a case of a transfer at death, we usually only look to a loose term trusts, quote unquote, funded uh, from the assets of the taxable estate. That's a sub separate subject in and of itself. So I'm going to give you a lazy way and a more intentional way of looking for this quote unquote indirect skip. 
The lazy ways first look if, to see if there is a gift, not a sale, to a transfer to an irrevocable trust. It may be the case that you have a part gift, part sale, but when it comes to GST exemption allocation, all we're going to be concerned with is a gift transfer to an irrevocable trust. Why not a revocable trust? Well, that's because typically a transfer to a revocable trust is not going to be subject to gift tax. It's an incomplete gift. And gift tax liability or reporting is the driver for the GST tax applying to a lifetime transfer, which is why, as we see in the sub bullet point, a sale would not be subject to GST exemption allocation because there is no gift tax on a sale, assuming it is for full fair market value. And if it's not, you might have a part gift, part sale. That's a subject for another time. So first, determine whether there is a gift to an irrevocable trust. Second, look to the terms of the trust itself. Are any beneficiaries now or in the future potentially a skip person? If so, this is what's known as GST potential. Anytime you have GST potential with a trust, if it's not subject to an exception we're about to look at, you're going to have automatic or manual allocation of GST exemption to that trust, and that trust is going to qualify um, as what's known as an indirect skip trust. So any transfer to that trust is going to be an indirect skip. Whenever it's an irrevocable trust, you're dealing with a gift, and there is GST potential. Now, in either of these cases, we can usually assume that there will be automatic allocation of GST exemption to that trust unless it qualifies for one of two exceptions, which I apologize for the sake of brevity and streamlining today, we have to break out. I'll mention the exceptions, but we're not going to dive into each today. For one, we have to make sure that the trust in question is a GST trust, which most trusts now drafted will be. It's more rare that you run into a situation where a trust is not a GST trust if it's an irrevocable trust being funded during life. But if it's not a GST trust, the consequence is that you lose this automatic allocation. However, you can still elect to treat it as a GST trust and have automatic allocation in the future. That's a subject coming up later, but long story short, there's an extensive list of characteristics in code section 2632C3B, which are going to give us what we need to define a GST trust. So once again, this is a negative. Uh, in order to have automatic allocation of GST exemption, the trust has to be a GST trust. If it's not, then there's no indirect skip, but there still could be allocation of GST trust exemption with an additional step of electing in, as we'll see. The other exception I have to tee up that we're not going to discuss today is that you have to make sure that the trust in question is not subject to an estate tax inclusion period, also known as an ETIP. If you have an ETIP, you lose the ability to both automatically and manually allocate your GST exemption to that trust unless or until that ETIP period closes. So we'll learn about ETIPs later as well, but the core why behind this is a value issue. You can, you're essentially forced to allocate GST exemption at the highest transfer tax value that could apply to a transferor or to a transferor's spouse. So this kind of gives us a hint at what the ETIP rule is going to be. If you, as the transferor, put property into a trust, which if you, were, you or your spouse were to die immediately after would be included in either of your gross estates, then the significance is that you cannot allocate GST tax exemption using the value at that time. You instead have to wait until the close of the ETIP period. And what we're going to find out is that you can still have automatic or manual allocation of GST exemption to an ETIP, even at the time it's funded. It's just that you're going to be forced to use the value that applies at the end of that ETIP period and not necessarily the value of the taxable gift being made to that trust. So long story short, what we're going to take this to is a more in-depth discussion of 
manual allocation of GST exemption versus automatic, and which might be better strategically. And that kind of tees up and segues from that value discussion we just had because this gives you some flexibility to either try to lock in the value and pin down the IRS or make the value a little more fluid to adjust to an ETIP or uh, maybe on the other hand, a later IRS challenge to the value of a sale or gift transaction. So we'll see how we can be strategic for that, but for the time being, remember this part three of Schedule A of the Form 709? Well, you can see there's a specific box in red here, the 2632C election. Essentially, you're gonna check that if you want to elect out of automatic allocation of GST exemption to a direct skip. But that's not enough. You have to both check that box and, as we're going to see, there's a few pages later, this part two, which gets into GST exemption reconciliation. And you can see I've circled uh, lines five and six, where it's listing out and describing an election out of the automatic allocation of GST exemption to transfers reported on Schedule A part three, which we just looked at. So as you see, it says we're gonna opt out of the automatic allocation rules by attaching an election out statement. And then we're gonna to go to line six and allocate exemption to transfers that are not shown on that line five, in which case we have to attach a notice of allocation, which is going to be, as we'll see, our mechanism for manual allocation. So because of that, what's coming? Well, first we're gonna really dive into making the GST exemption allocations on Form 709 and the strategic um, or the strategies behind that. Uh, and table for now to pick up after that discussion, the definition of GST trust and the definition of the estate tax inclusion period or ETIP and what effects it might have. And then another subject I introduce that's coming not necessarily sequentially, but somewhere down the road will be the GST tax annual exclusion and how it's affected by lifetime indirect skips and traditional crummy powers. So here's a glossary of terms so far for review. And we've added one more to the list today, and that is going to be indirect skip. As always, if you have questions or topic suggestions, you can email those to me at griffin.bridgers at gmail.com with the caveat that I cannot give tax or legal advice in response to your questions. But I thank you again for joining me for this part six of the basics of GST tax. Stay tuned for more in this series, and I look forward to seeing you in my future content.